at 20 years of age, I'm still looking for a dream. A war's already waged for my destiny. But you've already won the battle and you got great plans for me. Though I can't always see. Cause I got a couple dents in my fender. I got a couple rips in my jeans. Try to fit the pieces together. But perfection is my enemy and on my own I'm so clumsy But on your shoulders I can see I'm free to be me When I was just a girl I thought I had it figured out You see my life would turn out right And I'd make it here somehow but things don't always come that easy And sometimes I would doubt Oh, cause I got a couple dents in my fender I got a couple rips in my jeans I try to fit the pieces together But perfection is my enemy And on my own I'm so clumsy But on your shoulders I can't see I'm free to be me And you're free to be you Sometimes I believe That I can't do anything Yet other times I think I got nothing good to bring but you look at my heart and you tell me that I've got all you seek. Oh, and it's easy to believe, even though I got a couple dents in my fender. I got a couple rips in my jeans. I try to fit the pieces together. But perfection is my enemy and on my own I'm so clumsy But on your shoulders I can't see I've got a couple dents in my fender I got a couple rips in my jeans I try to fit the pieces together But perfection is my enemy and on my own I'm so clumsy but on your shoulders I can see I'm free to be me And you're free to be you Good morning, Hope Church. It's so awesome. Yes, John, to see everybody here this morning. Okay, so first things first. Ready? Show and tell. Bulletin? Check. <laughs> Cup of water. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> bulletin. Okay, inside your bulletin, you have a couple things this morning. First, you have a little white piece of paper, okay? And this is for sure. There's also lots of information right on the inside about Shore. We love Shore, huh, Hope? Yes, Shore is awesome. Okay, so Shore has some new things going on. So uh, make sure that you read through this. They need your help. They're having a um, yard sale, and they're having a pancake breakfast, and they're trying to raise money to get a new building because they're going to ch kind of change how they did their program. So make sure you read that in the bulletin. And then this little paper in there is for you to give to a friend. Okay? So the bulletin's for you. The flyer's for a friend. We're going we're gonna to see what we can't do to get an uprising going on to help this wonderful program. And then the next thing I wanted to mention is Blitz. So Blitz as we know, is our bringing love into the streets, okay? It's how, at Hope, we reach out to the homeless in our community. We also support Shore, but this is another way. Um, so they need some donations. They need toiletries and supplies, peanut butter, jelly, bread, um, and we're working on getting a place for you guys to have a designated place for donations, but you can bring them to Hope in here. You can bring them to me at the office. You can bring them. We'll find a place for them until we get a designated one, but... They're really doing an awesome job getting out there to our homeless in the community, and we need supplies. You have a question, Lisa? Okay. 
Yeah, it really is an amazing program. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, make sure you get those donations in, okay? Next, contact cards, everybody have one? Yay, okay, so these are not just for us to have your information, but there's prayer requests on the back, okay? We have a team that prays, and we get those out there. If it's confidential, you mark the little box, and those only go straight to stand, and nobody else sees them. Um, but we have had a prayer request, and I am happy to say that Trudy Kinsey is doing better. She had a procedure over the week, and so I would just like to let you guys know that she's doing better than expected. She says hi to everybody, and she's so thankful for all of the prayers. So thank you, Hope. That's what a family is all about. So um, in lieu of that, why don't we get up and greet each other? Find someone you don't know. I see some new faces, and tell them they found the friendliest church this side of that side. Strange and lovely sound. I hear it in the thunder and the rain. It's ringing in the skies like cannons in the night. The music of the universe plays. We're singing to you, our only, great and mighty, the moon and Stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever. My heart will sing of how great you are. Free. 
the song of galaxy reaching far beyond the milky way let's join in with the sound come on let's sing it out as the music of the universe plays we're singing to you are holy great and mighty the moon and the stars declare who you I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. We sing of our faith, our glory, honor, power is yours, amen. Our glory, honor, power is yours, amen. Our glory, honor, power is yours. Forever, amen. We're singing to you, our holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me. just amazes me can circumstances possibly change who I forever am in you maybe since my life has changed Long before these rainy days, it's never really ever crossed my mind to turn my back on you, oh Lord, my only shelter from the storms, but instead I draw closer through this time. Little rain. 
You sound beautiful, Hope. tasted and seen the sweetest of lies where my heart becomes free and my shame is together 
There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home. In your presence, Lord. I have tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame. The love of God is selfless and so pure. We don't see this often in the world, but we see this when we look at the cross. God, who loves us so much, sent his only son to die, sent him to death to spare us from the punishment that we deserve the body and the blood of Jesus, it frees us and it saves us and it offers us life eternal forever with our creator. And as we take communion this morning, let's remember that love that frees us from punishment and offers us life that saves us. Let's remember Jesus. Never go, you'll never 
you always stay and I love you cannot be said a better way it's everything you promise there's no greater love than this from prophets until today a man laying down his life for his forever Cannot be said a better way. I am forgiven. I give. That's why you came to do all you did for me. Treat us with heaven. Took my place, and I love you cannot be said a better way. It's everything you promised. There's no greater love than this. From prophets until today. Cannot be said a better way. Because you redeem, I know what's to come. Everything I could lose here, you've already won. So have my surrender, my surrender. with passion or faith. I love you, cannot be seen a better way. It's everything you promised. a better way something more than my selfish hopes and my selfish dreams I'm lying with my face down on the floor and crying out for more and crying out for more and give me words to speak so let my spirits leave Cause I can't think of anything worth saying But I know that I owe you my life So give me words to speak Don't let my spirits leave Yeah. 
every day I find that I have nothing I can say So I stand here in silence Waiting your guidance I'm wanting only your voice to be heard Let it be your word Let it be your words Give me words to speak Don't let my spirits leave Cause I can't think of anything worth saying But I know that I owe you my life So give me words to speak Don't let my spirits leave I just don't understand this life that I've been living. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. I just don't understand these lies I've been believing. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. So give me words to speak, don't let my spirits leave, cause I can't think of anything worth saying, but I know that I owe you my life, so give me words to speak, don't let my spirits leave, give me words to speak. Don't let my spirits leave Cause I can't think of anything worth saying But I know that I owe you my life So give me words to speak Don't let my spirits leave I know that I owe you my life Hope Church First Service, you glad to be here today? Yeah, yeah it's good to see all of you. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, yesterday, uh, well, first, give it up for the most dangerous worship band on the West Coast, Hope Rising. Yeah. We're so blessed to have these guys lead us every week, and they work hard to bless us and lead us, and I really appreciate them. Um, so yesterday we had a memorial for Sean Kennedy, who was the son of one of our members, Carmel, and it was very touching, and we, we thank uh, all of you who worked hard to help out with that. It's an honor to have uh, some of Carmel's family here with us today, and I uh, just wanted to thank you, church, for being the hosts that you always are. And uh, also, I heard a rumor that Joe and Joan Be Becker celebrated 49 years of marriage. That's awesome. Joan, you are a patient lady. Just kidding, just kidding. Not. <laughs> okay, that's right. So uh, if you're a visitor, I would like to ask you to close your ears just for a moment. You can daydream for a moment because I want to do some family business. I think I have some slides on that about a family need. Do we have that? Okay, cool. Um, 
I don't do this very often to come to you about financial needs. I don't, I don't do that intentionally, on purpose, because when they do lists of why people don't go to church, there's always an item on there that says, because churches are always trying to get in my pocket. And so I intentionally don't talk about money every week. Now, I don't back off if I'm in a text that deals with it, because it's a part of our spirituality. But I, I, I'm, I want people who walk through those doors that are seeking God and in hurting and needing, I want them to find God's love, not go, aha, I knew it, you know. And, uh, but I have come to you the last five years every now and then when there's a need and you've always responded. And I wanted you to know, if you've been watching our bulletin, uh, the last few weeks we've been dealing with a very low income in June. And uh, in fact, our giving in June was half of what our need is. So if you do the math, that's not very healthy. And uh, in fact, we have a Rock the Ridge schedule to come up in September. And I don't have it on a slide, but in October, we have our Harvest Festival where we invite moms and dads to bring their kids from the community for a safe place. And the Rock the Ridge is an outreach thing that we're, we love to do because we give to our community. And so uh, what I want you to know is that uh, 59% of our expenses goes to staff. That's for four people, one full-time, three part-time, which is very good. Uh, sometimes churches are over 80%. We, as far, the rest of that goes for our campus and for ministries. Our, I want you to know our mortgage is a little over 1,800, which 1,800 doesn't sound high to some people because they have a mortgage like that on their house. To others, that may sound high to you, but if you take into consideration, we are many families that make one family. 1,800 on all these acres with room to grow is an awesome opportunity, and we're going to pay that off. Amen? Amen. Uh, but take the 59%, take the 1,800, and you add some utilities and things, that shows you that we have a lot of money more, that goes to ministries and goes to outreach. I'm proud of that. I came here with a mantra, low overhead, high action. And we have a volunteer revolution. We have people like Art and Gloria who spent more hours here this week probably than I did uh, pouring themselves out in our landscaping. Just showed up and worked so hard. And others are doing that in all kinds of ways. I just mentioned our band. There's people volunteering all over the place. So uh, we want our money to go to ministry and to our community. And so that's why I wanted to come to you and just let you know where we're at. Here's what you can do to help. Number one, if you're a person that has prospered, that is prospering, uh, where you're able to give more than you regularly give for one-time gift, pray about it. And only if you feel led by God. I don't want anybody to give begrudgingly. Or, okay. You know, if you feel excited, led by God to help us out, we could use your help. Number two, if you're already doing all you can do and are not able to give financially to help with this need, please don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad. Do not worry. We got here growing, stepping out in faith. We couldn't afford one full-time person five years ago. And God will take care of us. And we, we've stepped out and helped our community in faith. Uh, but I, uh, I don't want anybody in the culture of our church to be all stressed out and worried about it. Number three, here's what everyone can do. Pray. Pray. God says don't worry. He says pray and trust in him. So pray that our finances grow just as our ministries are growing and our ch outreach is growing and our church is growing. That's, that's very common, that growth of church and ministries is faster than growth of finances. It's just a reality, and it takes time for that to grow. So pray for that to grow, okay? And I'd like to do that right now. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for our family, and I pray that anybody visiting today doesn't uh, feel um, weirded out by our little business meeting I just did, because we're here about you. Uh, but I do pray that those of us in the family that are committed to hope will do all we can and, uh, and not worry about what we can't do, and that we will trust in you, God. You have you've brought us this far. And we thank you for what you're doing. And we don't want to stop reaching out, God. We don't want to stop our ministry. So please, God, take care of this need. We believe you will. I, I know I've seen this church step up over and over where the need and respond. And I thank you in advance for what you're going to do and that you get all the glory in it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. So last week... Uh, I was in New York in, on Long Island, and I uh, got to walk my daughter, my third daughter, Courtney, down the aisle for her marriage. And b being in the back with her, I got to watch it all unfold in this beautiful setting in Long Island. And I got to see uh, 
two of my daughters, part of the bridesmaids, and go down. And then I got to see three of my grandsons walk down. They had shorts and suspenders and shades on. They were cool. That's my posse, I call them. But they went down, and uh, I was just thinking, boy, I wish my mom could see this. It was so awesome. Then I got to walk my daughter down, and the, the pastor at the altar there is my son, Zach. And uh, he says, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Like I coached him to say. And uh, I say, uh, do I have a choice? And he didn't see that coming. He's got a surprise look. And, and then I look at Willie, who is my new son outlaw, and I say, Willie, even if Tracy and I had a choice, we would choose you. Uh, he treats our, our daughter like a princess. And I, I said, you're a good man, William. And I handed off my daughter. And uh, so we had a great family time. The whole family, it was a new thing that Zach did. I've never done. He had us a family prayer in the middle of the ceremony, and all our family came up, and I got to say a prayer over them. So it was a, a, a lifetime highlight. And then I'm flying home, Tracy and I, on Sunday, jet blue, and I'm able to get free internet, and I'm able to plug into our service live and, and worship with you live on an airplane. How cool is that? And uh, the band was awesome. And how, how about uh, Gina Darby? Let's give it up for the great job she did. So good. So good. And... She did a great job, and we're in this series about thinking about our brains, because what we believe in our brain, in our heart of hearts, in our mind, uh, impacts uh, who we are and how we behave. It impacts our relationships. What we believe about God impacts us. If we believe negative thoughts about God, it impacts our brain. It, it impacts us, our emotions. We can be afraid. We can live in fear. It impacts our relationships. We can become judgmental if we think God is this punishing, judgmental God. Well, we're supposed to be like him. On the flip side, if it's positive and we see the positive view that is in Scripture, the whole of Scripture, it impacts our emotions. It impacts our joy level. It impacts our relationships. Mahatma Gandhi was someone who's world famous in history for motivating uh, mobs of people, multitudes of people in India to fight for freedom with nonviolence. And um, the name Mahatma was given to him, and it means venerable or uh, soulful. I like that. High-souled is what it means. Uh, but in India, he's known Mahatma all over the world, but in India, he's also called Bapu. Bapu is a term of endearment, which means father or papa, which shows you that he led out of a loving relationship with his people there. And he uh, motivated movements all over the world for uh, human rights. And he said this, power is of two kinds. One is obtained by the fear of punishment and the other by acts of love. Power based on love is a thousand times more effective and permanent than the one derived from fear of punishment. And I love that quote because where he says that the power of love based on love is more effective and permanent, I think that's because it's relational. It's a healthy relational kind of uh, motivation. If you're motivated by fear of punishment, that's not healthy, relational, and it's not permanent. It's not something you want to be permanent. You want the love to be permanent. And so uh, the psychiatrist, Dr. Jennings, tells about Laura. Laura came to him. She has a long history of depression. She worried about everything. She worried about how people would treat her. She worried about money. She worried about paying the bills. She worried if her friends really liked her. She had a chronic fear of abandonment and uh, intense feelings of loneliness. She was terrified of losing people that she loved. And so with that, she never would let herself get too close to people because, hey, if you're going to lose people you love, don't get too close. And she had a, uh, a fear of... of uh, um, of health issues, of, of, of getting sick, of dying. Uh, she was employed. She hated her job. She treated with uh, medications, no significant improvement. She's unhappy with her life. She's unhappy with her circumstances. And anger is brewing beneath this surface of fear and discouragement. And he looks at her and he says, do you believe in God? And she says, don't you dare talk to me about God. And uh, as he kind of continued to probe, she, she doubted his existence, but at the same time was angry with him. So this God that she doubted existed, she was mad at, 
and all her life she felt persecuted, punished, beaten up by God. Whether, uh, whenever something negative happened in her life, it was God's fault. And even when things were going good in her life, she had this nagging fear that any time God's going to step in and ruin her joy. She didn't believe in God, yet she hated him and feared him. And as he talked more about her life history, he found out that when she was a little girl, her mom died in a car accident. And at the funeral... The pastor, the well-meaning pastor said, God took your mommy to be with him. And at that moment, a lie was implanted in her mind that God takes mommies from their children. God is the source of pain. God is the source of suffering. God is the source of death. Lies believed in our brain, in our mind, break the circle of love and trust. So he says, tell me, about this God you don't really believe in. And she describes a cruel tyrant, a being who is arbitrarily abusing his power to inflict pain and suffering on his creatures that must be appeased, who doesn't care that his children are abused, the the one who takes mommies from their children. And the, the psychiatrist says, I don't believe in him either. And his point was that we should reject a hideous conception of God. Lies about God incite fear and activate our emotions and damage our brain. Restoration starts by removing the lies and restoring trust. See, I I, I really relate to this because I no longer believe in a God who's so strict that he's ready to punish us if we don't get it right, if we don't do church perfect, if we don't do uh, read the Bible a certain amount of time, if we don't do these acts of service. He's really angry with us. He's watching to make sure we do it. God is love. And the fact is, it's very good for your brain and your heart when you understand if you're suffering through something, God's not punishing you. He's weeping with you. That's why it's so important that we change our view about God if we have any Uh, unscriptural, unbiblical, negative view about God. Some of us grew up in a church culture where there was kind of this no questions pleased culture. And it maybe wasn't said verbally, but you just kind of knew you don't ask questions about the traditions or some of the beliefs. And you can be raised in a church and involved in a church, go to Sunday school, trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you feel some feelings of insecurities or doubt, you know you better not ask about that. You've got to keep that hidden because you believe in Jesus. So you can't really ask questions. So you learn to, to just believe Go to church, don't question anything, pretend, hide, and you're like that robot uh, that I've told you about before where uh, uh, I went years ago in Long Beach to a youth rally and a spotlight was on a girl and she said, God, I'm so lonely, please send someone to me. And her eyes brighten up, she sees someone coming and this person comes up, hi, how are you? Good to see you. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. And walks right by. And that's how we do church sometimes because we surely can't say, well, I'm really having a hard time. I'm struggling with my faith right now. I'm angry with God right now. I'm disappointed with the circumstance. You got to put the mask on and just believe, just have faith. That comes from a distortion about the God of the Bible. This is a distortion to think that God doesn't want you to ask any questions. Just do religion Just, uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Don't question anything. Don't study and try to get into it and question with God. You go into the Bible, God has discussions with Abraham and discussions with Moses. Moses says, God, this is not going to look good if you destroy your people here when God's upset about how things are going. There's this journeying, this struggle, this relationship. In the New Testament, Paul's dealing with this culture of you have Jewish background Christians, and you have Gentile background Christians, and now they've they're got to live in the same family and be a, a brothers and sisters in Christ. And so you can imagine there's different traditions and beliefs. There's people that went to temples um, where they had uh, 
sacrifice altar to false gods, and now they become believers in the one true God, and so they hated that meat that was used at those temples, but that meat was sold into other people. It didn't bother them uh, because it wasn't out of faith to them, and then you had dietary rules that the Jews were used to. Gentiles didn't, didn't care about those things. You had all these different things they had to, to, to get along, and Paul makes this statement in Romans, who are you to judge someone else's servant? What a great lesson for churches to learn, amen? That's why we say around here we have one rule, Jesus, and let God be the judge, and uh, he's the only one qualified, amen? It's a good, good, good day when you realize, I, I don't have to tell everybody who's going to heaven, who's going to hell, I don't have to be the judge, only God is qualified for that, amen? And so Jesus is our, our, our guide, and Paul says, study this out, basically he's saying, each of them, in Romans 14, 5, should be fully convinced in their what? their own mind. He doesn't say, just have faith. Don't struggle with this. Uh, let the pastor tell you what to do. No, he says, use your brain. Use your own mind. In the book of Hebrews, the people are being tempted to fall away from God. They're going through difficult times, hard times, and he's writing to them, te teaching about you have Christ and how it's so much greater. And he says, there's some things I want to tell you more about this, but you're not able to understand because you're like babies. You're not, you're not feeding on any meat. And he says, but solid food... Hebrews 5.14, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. No, evil. Notice that, constant use. Mature people are not people that we all have it together. We all fall short. But they're, they're people that struggle, grapple, train themselves to discern the truth. Jesus said this to his disciples, I am no longer calling you servants. Because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You know, servants are told what to do in a, in a household. But the family, he says, is told the plans. And Jesus taught his disciples God is love and we come to, to reach all, all nations and spread this message of love and my Holy Spirit's going to help you. And there's nowhere where it says don't question, don't think. No, he says I'll go through this with you and you learn and as you learn uh, what I've passed on to you from the Father, you will grow. So there's this God don't make no junk quote that uh, some of us have said or heard and I understand the motive behind it and I think it's cool. And I think from a qualitative standpoint, God doesn't make junk. But I don't believe that means that God creates genetic flaws, that God creates diseases, that, that God creates defects, that God creates sin. When you go to Scripture, God created Adam and Eve, and God created Jesus. In between and after, it's the, the ability that he gave Adam and Eve to procreate, to have children that God set in place with natural laws. He set that in place, and because of God's love, he's given human beings freedom of choice. That's a part of chose his love. He didn't turn us into robots where we'd be perfect all the time. Sometimes I wish I would, or I could, but I can't, but uh, he wants me to want him, and he wants me to, to live out of love because he's love. Love is outgoing and so and out, uh, outreaching, and so he created this Adam and Eve with the ability to procreate, and then we make choices, human beings, and they have consequences, and they pass down things, and you go through all the generations. God doesn't give schizophrenia. God does not give autism. God does not give bipolar disorders. All defects, all things that we deal with in life uh, that are negative or that are difficult can be a result of sin. It can be from contaminating and, da and damaging God's creation. Love does not, cannot create imperfection. Well, what about Psalm 139, 13? For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Don't question it. Wait a minute. That means that if God knit me together with heart defects with spina bifida with deformities god's having a bad knitting day god is not directly creating babies with congenital defects children born 
addicted to drugs because their parents were drug addicts was not something that God knitted together, but through the free will they were passed along. Now, I do believe that God has a destiny and a purpose and loves personally every single baby that comes into this world, but God didn't knit us all together with our imperfections. During anarchy in the Sudan, Arab men were raping Sudanese women by tens of thousands in order to have more children of Arab descent. Should we think, well, that was God's plan to use rape to, to, to have more babies? Does God create sin? Does God create uh, sinners so that we will sin? No, we are born with a sinful nature because our, we have a free will and our first parents blew it and Satan is on the loose for a while. And Adam and Eve were created sinless, Jesus was created by God, and he lived sinless. Adam and Eve had the fall, and God's role in our individual lives is to still work through our choices. Did God, did God give Samson strength? I believe he did. Did God control how Samson used it? No. Samson had the freedom to use his strength, and sometimes he got in trouble with it, and sometimes he did good. God gave Solomon wisdom. But did God control Solomon on the choices and how he used it? No. Sometimes he did good with it. Then he married a lot of, of uh, women who were into idolatry. He got into trouble. So, he did, so God personally lurk, works in our life. And his design template of humanity set in place. The laws of nature and physics that govern reproduction. He's knitting together through this design of laws that he put in place. But he's not directly creating each of us with sin or disease or a defect. And I believe that you got to hear me, though, that he does have value. No matter how a person is born, God loves that person. There are illegitimate parents sometimes, but not illegitimate babies. And God cares about every single person that is born. And he has a destiny and he has a purpose for you and you are valued. But he didn't knit into you any faults. Our current condition is a result of the creation being infected with sin and that all nature is groaning over the weight of sin. Romans 8.28 talks about the creation groaning. So we've got to think about the power of truth. See, there's kind of this mindset in the world, sincerity is truth. It doesn't matter what you believe. You believe what you believe. I'll believe what I believe. As long as we're both sincere, then that's okay. The problem with that is the Greek word belogna that I talk about a lot. You know, if one of you say my eyes are blue and one of you says they're, they're gray, uh, you, can, one, you can both be wrong, but you can't be both right, unless they're blue-gray or something, but uh, they're not. And, and so there's one truth, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's always easy to figure out the truth. In fact, Deuteronomy 29.29, if you could write that on your outline if you're a note taker, it says in Deuteronomy 29.29, the secret things of God are for God. They're hidden, and those things that God has revealed are for us and for our children forever. So there's some things we're going to get up there someday. God, what was up with this, or what was up with that? But God has revealed things that he wants us to know for our family and for our lives, and we can discover new truths as we use our brains and we, just, we try to. Galileo said, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. You know, that's the, tr the, the truth about sin is what I wanted to mention. We have to understand what sin's about. Um, if a diabetic says, uh, I, I've been healed, He's gone to a revival. They have a healing. They get all emotional, and he actually gets endorphins, and he feels like, I'm healed, and the pastor says, you're healed, and he goes off insulin. He has a good chance of ending up in a hospital uh, at de death's door. He, he's got to use his brain. I'm not saying God did do miracles. I believe he has the power to do that. I'm just saying we have to be careful about not uh, thinking through what we do and thinking about the truth. Uh, you know, the truth about sin is sin are symptoms. We have good days, we have bad days. If we just focus on our sin, we're focusing on our symptoms. This is why I get a little nervous with some accountability groups. I've been in discipleship ministries where we had high accountability because our motive was love and good and we wanted to help each other fight sin. What we end up doing all the time was a guilt trip focused on sin. So how'd you do last week? How much did you read your Bible? How much did you evangelize? How many family devotionals did you do? How are you and your wife doing? Did you go on a date? And it's a focus and focus and focus on struggles and weakness. I'd rather focus on our encouragement and, and uh, focus on the heart. And God 
God is more interested in our heart and our mind than just going through some behavior modification. Those are symptoms. Listen to what David said in Psalm 139 and in 51. He said, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. That's the kind of relationships where we have, hey, how's your heart? How's your heart? And when we feel discouraged, hey, hang in there. Keep a steadfast spirit. Don't give up. That's the healthy focus we need in our accountability and in our relationships, not a tearing each other down. And sin is a symptom. If you just have, if you have a cough, uh, you're, you're more concerned about what the, what the real problem is and rather than just dealing with a symptom, amen? amen. So we've got to enlarge our view about God. God is awesome. God is powerful. God is sovereign, but God is also loving. Listen to this quote. True love does not come by finding the perfect person, but by lear- learning to see an imperfect person perfectly. When you get married... You've got to know you've got an imperfect mate and not be one of those couples where you go, honey, here's the mold of the perfect spouse. Lay down in this mold and then I will love you. That will not work. And if you've ever been in relationships that are very conditional, it's not relational. It's not loving. It's not enduring. Now, if you've been in a relationship where they knew you were imperfect and they loved you anyway, that was love. That's true love. That's how the God of heaven is. And yet, sometimes we mess up. What does God think about that? And I want to show you Old Testament passage. It's going to be scary at first. So so fasten your seatbelts, but let me finish it off, okay? It begins from Isaiah 1. The ox knows its master, the donkey its own manager. But Israel does not know me. My people do not understand. Let's stop for a moment. He uses the word no. If you gave Israel a pop quiz, do you know who uh, uh, the God of Israel is? Well, yeah. He led us out of Egypt, and he set us, made us a people, and we have a relation. They could do the pop quiz, but he's using the word know relationally. The Hebrew mind meant there was to know was in your head and in your mouth and in your hands and in your feet. It was your life, and it was a relationship. When it says Mary was found to be with child, but she had not known a man, it meant the most intimate relationship we can have physically. God says, my people don't have a relationship with anymore. They're going through some religious stuff with me, but they're also involved with these other gods of the culture, and they've left me. Look, look what else he says. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough burnt offerings of rams, of the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, convocations. I I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals, I hate them with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Would you say God's pretty upset here? Israel's in bad shape here, right? But you can't stop there. Let me just ask you, he's upset with their assemblies, their sacrifices, and those festivals. Who told him to do those things? God did. He told him to do those things for their relationship, out of a relationship, but they're just doing it out of a religion. You've heard my story about tradition, where the, the, the mom always cut the, the, the ham when she put it in the pan. Finally, her husband goes, why do you always cut the ham? And she says, well, my mom did it. Actually, it's the daughter does it. She asks, he calls the mom. The mom says, well, grandma always did it. She cut the ham before she put it in the pan. So they call grandma. Why do you always cut the ham and you put it in the pan, put it in the oven? She said, because my pan was too small. And sometimes traditions passed on because somebody else did it, and we mindlessly go through that, and we no longer bring our sacrifices out of a pure heart and love with God and a relationship with God. We do church to do church. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. We put on the mask, and we go on our own lifestyle, doing our own thing, and God says, I love you. I'm crazy about you. I want to have a relationship with you. Now, write down verse 18. I didn't give it to you on your outline. I wanted you to just to see. If it stops here, you could say, God's a pretty mean God. I don't know about it doesn't stop here come now let us settle the matter says the lord though your sins are like scarlet 
they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. He says, you think you're stained. You can't get it off, but I'll take care of that. He woos Israel. He shows grace to Israel. He loves her. He's jealous for her. So if you take a little piece, you can get nervous. you got to take the whole of Scripture. Then he ultimately, through Israel, sends Jesus not only for them, but for all nations, all people. Anyone now can have this relationship with the God who is love, the God who gives grace. I grew up in a football home. My dad played, my uncle played, my big brother played. I was little when my big brother, who's four years older, and his friends would play, have me play with them. They, I was a chunky guy. I know that surprises you. And I would carry the ball, and they would jump on my back. Sometimes I'd be crying and mad, and they loved it, you know, the big guys. And I'd, oh, let's play. And so I always played all my life. And then when I got in high school, of course, I played. And I play, played uh, in junior college. And one thing I learned is there's different kinds of coaches. There's some who coach out of humiliation, fear of punishment, and don't really seem to care about you. And there's others that, that coach that seem to love you and care about you as a person more than just what you do on the field. And guess who's more inspiring, right? Uh, I played my favorite year out of high school and college was a, actually a junior varsity year. We had a coach fresh out of the Marines and uh, he would be tough with us sometimes, you know, on your knees, on your back, on your stomach. I mean, he was, he was a driver, but he loved us. And we started winning. And we got past half season, and we started doing this thing after the game. We would run around the field in front of our stands and then the other stands going, we're number one. We're number one. We always wondered, does coach think we're getting too cocky? Is he mad at us? He never said anything about it. So we kept doing it. We get down to game 10, last game, still undefeated. I was playing line. My best friend was a running back, Greg Dobbs, who's at PID, caretaker of the lake, was one of the slot backs. And uh, we're wondering what he thought about the, all this stuff. And the team we're playing last is supposed to be as good as us. So people are like, maybe this one will break the streak. We're 9-0. and We're in the locker room. He goes, I love every one of you guys. And he started talking about us by our number. He says, 75, that's my number. He loves to hit. And, uh, he, and the running back, my buddy said, no one can bring him down. And he just talked about every one of us. And he says, now I want you guys to go out there before the game and let them know what number you are. He told us to do it before the game. And here we were worried he got mad after the game. We got so fired up, we started hitting in the locker room. You ever see bowl games where they come out on the field, start hitting? We were doing it in the locker room. It wasn't for show. We were so fired up. Ah! And we ran out there, we're number one. And the opposing team, some of them started booing us. And, of course, our fans were like, yeah. And we owned them. We owned them. It wasn't even close. Blew them away. Ran off the field, did it one more time, one last time. When we got to the opposing team, some of them standed up and applauded. You know why we did 10 and 0? Our coach. And he didn't coach out of humiliation and berating. He coached us out of love. And you have a God in heaven who's not punishing you. And if you're suffering, he's not saying that's what you deserve. He's actually weeping with us when we go through our hurts. And he doesn't promise all the answers, but he promises his presence. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I am with you. He says over and over in Scripture. Please take the scriptural view of the God of love. Don't let your Christian friends that are a little more nervous and think God's mad, don't let them impact your brain. You, you got your own brain. It's a gift. Use it to see the true God that is love. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I pray that uh, we see how important this is because... Because of tradition, because of Satan, because of negative influences in the world, we can get an improper view of you, and it's heartbreaking to know that here you are a God of love, but people can be uh, led to believe a lie about you. God, help us to prune those circuits in our brains that are untrue. Maybe we've been impacted by a parent or by a person that told us we're stupid or told us negativity all our life. Help us to prune all that negativity and put down tracks of positive love to know God is love, that we are valued, um, that you, we're somebody, not because you don't love us because we're somebody. We're somebody because you love us. And no one can take that away, your love. And we promise to go out of here committed to, to examining the truth about you. And we, we pray for anyone here who's just new to getting to know you, that you will make yourself known to them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship God.
Hey, thank you, brother. Yeah. The answer lies in you. You hung to make me strong. Though my praise was few. When I fall, I bring your name down. But I have found in you a heart that bleeds for you. Replacing all the thoughts of painful Thank you, guys. Now it's time to pray for our offering. I don't know, a little wimpy. Now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we celebrate giving because we've learned from you that life's not just about consuming, but making a contribution. And if there's anyone that's hurting financially, Lord, help them not to feel guilty at this part of our service. But just give your, their heart to you, and, and you will bless them, I know. As they do that. Father, if there's uh, people here, though, that are prospering, that are committed to the vision of hope, I pray we give cheerfully and uh, that you make us a force of hope and love here on the ridge and beyond. Until Jesus comes, I pray that you'll be in the middle of it. We don't want to do it without you, God. We want it to your glory, and we can't do it without you. So please help. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we give, what is our purpose? Building relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every single day this week in Christ, we always have hope. Thanks for being here.